question for you, and I thought it would be, was uh, number two about whether the fever is in homeostasis or not. Okay. Many of you said shivering was a way to get the temperature back down. Does shivering get temperature, get heat out of your body, or does it produce heat? Yes. Produces heat. Some of you said it was positive feedback. What would happen if it was positive feedback? It would just keep going up until it killed you. It was a tough question because we hadn't directly addressed it. Um, and we hadn't directly addressed the point that set points can change sometimes. There are certain factors that can change a set point. Okay, so I, I didn't, everybody got at least half a point of credit out of those two, and some of you got more depending on what your explanation was. But does it make sense to you guys? Let's talk about it a second now. What if I have a temperature, what's body temperature? 37 degrees Celsius. So what if my temperature is 39, but my set point has become 40? How are you going to feel? Cold, and your body will shiver to try and produce heat, try and get your temperature up, okay? So all of you have probably had that experience where you have a fever. The thermometer in your mouth says whatever it says, 101 or something like that Fahrenheit, yet you're freezing and shivering and you're under blankets and that kind of stuff, right? Your set point has changed. Higher temperature, many of you wrote that a higher temperature will help you fight the infection better, and that's true. Okay, enzymes work at a faster rate. It will help you. Becca? I guess, I guess maybe it's a little confused about positive feedback. But if you say that like, things like labor and things like that, there is a, there's a new set point, and it's positive feedback, so it's positive feedback until it hits the set point, or not? No, they don't have a new set point, but there is something else that will eventually stop that, yeah, or else... Yeah, that's different than changing the set point. You got it. Okay. And then what happens when you, quote, unquote, break a fever? Your set point's now at 37 degrees again, but your temperature's at 40, so how do you feel? Yeah, all of a sudden you're throwing off the blankets and you're sweating like crazy. Everybody know what I'm talking about? You've had that feeling? Okay. So something about a fever. By the way, exercise resets your blood pressure set point, for example. Okay, so there's other examples of set points resetting that we have in physiology, too. Um, so that was the hardest one, I think, because it was the one that you were the least prepared for, and probably more so than any question you'll see the rest of the semester as far as not necessarily having all the tools you need. Okay? Connor, is that a question or a stretch? Yeah. If a higher temperature helps you fight that infection better, then it's advantageous for a short time, for a day, for a few hours, for a few days, something like that. So it sets a higher set point in order to raise your body temperature. Yeah. Yep. Let's also talk about the last one, the graph, about enzymes and temperature. Because the rest of these, I think, you may not think so, but the rest of them are pretty straightforward if you did your homework and studied all your notes. Remember what I said in the beginning, anything that we talk about in class is fair game on a quiz or an exam. And sometimes it may involve a little detail too. Okay? And I won't apologize for that, and I won't apologize for the ones that ask you to think a little bit. So the first line on this graph should have been fairly easy for you if you studied your enzyme packet because all I did is ask you to reproduce one of those graphs. What's the relationship between substrate concentration and reaction rate Okay, at normal temperature? The second part of that asked you to take some information that you hadn't seen in a graph like this. We had a temperature graph in your notes and some of the, you that threw off because you were trying to make temperature the x-axis or things like that, right? Some of you switch the axes around too, by the way. Which one is the determining factor? Is reaction rate something that is determining what the substrate concentration is? Substrate concentration is determining what reaction rate is. That makes substrate concentration the independent variable and the x-axis. Okay. If you memorized the shape of the line or recalled that, but you got the axes wrong, that's a whole different relationship. Okay, 
So in a graph, that doesn't say at all what you want it to say here. That describes a whole different relationship. So at 80, and some of you have probably read this by now, what, well, let me back up. What's the relationship between temperature and reaction rate? As temperature increases, reaction rate increases up to a certain point, somewhere in the low 40s, a little higher than 40. So at 80, what's going to happen to the enzyme? It's going to be denatured. Is it going to work at all? No. So does it matter how much substrate you throw at the enzyme? No. It can't work anyways. You're going to have a zero line no matter what substrate concentration. Okay? Which is a line that you didn't see on a graph anywhere. But if you understand the things that we talked about, it should be fairly straightforward. Megan? Pretty, pretty unlikely, but if you showed a decrease, I gave you guys credit. I drew another line on your graph, but I said okay and gave you full credit. If you showed that 80 had a lower reaction rate than 37, okay? So for anybody who did that, they still got credit. Any other questions? Feel free if you have some other ones to ask me during lab or any other time too, okay? Any questions? So let's shift gears now. Any questions on membrane potential or action potential stuff that we've set up so far, that we've covered so far? <coughs> By the way, for those of you who have lab today, make sure you bring your packet with you and make sure you bring shoes that are closed toed. Okay. No questions? Then let's Revisit this figure right here, and let me explain the rest of this figure, because we only got partway through it on Tuesday. Okay. Remember that we have a resting membrane potential. A potential is a charge difference. The inside of the cell is negative compared to the outside. The reason for that is mainly twofold. One, we have trapped anions, fixed anions inside the cell. That attracts positive charges, and the only positive charge that can get through the membrane in any appreciable amount is potassium. So potassium moves in, but not in sufficient quantity to offset the fixed anions, because then concentration starts to move it out, so we have a resting membrane potential. And the sodium-potassium pump helps maintain those sodium and potassium concentrations inside and outside the cell as well. Then we have a stimulus that comes along, and we'll talk a little bit more about how that happens later, not right now yet. And that stimulus opens sodium channels. Sodium channels, by the way, are voltage operated. Okay, So a certain membrane voltage will turn them on. We'll also talk during this semester about receptor-operated channels. For example, a neurotransmitter binds to a receptor on the cell membrane and causes a channel to open. But the channels we're talking about right now are voltage-operated. In other words, when we get to a certain voltage, that's like the light switch. Okay, That turns on that channel, or in other words, it opens that channel. So we open sodium channels. Which way will sodium move? Sodium will move in because of concentration gradient and electrical gradient. If sodium is the only player, where would sodium like the membrane potential to get to? 61. 61. Remember ENA, the equilibrium potential for sodium. So sodium would rush in until we got up to 61 if the channel stayed open. So sodium rushes in, positive charges moving in. That means the inside of the membrane is getting more positive, and you see this depolarization phase of the action potential in the pink line here. And notice the yellow line, we have increased permeability to sodium because those channels opened. Let me back up now. Let's hold on to that for a second. Let's go to the corner insets. Down here in the lower left describes what's happening with channels in the membrane under resting conditions. 
And there's one channel missing from this figure, but I can't find a better figure. Okay? So I'll talk about that in just a minute. Notice the sodium channel, first of all. The sodium channel has two gates. Well, let me, let me even back up a little further. This is the outside of the cell. This is the inside of the cell down here. Outside above, inside below. Okay? <clears throat> so we have sodium high um, outside. We're going to have potassium high inside, just to remind you again. Notice that this sodium channel has two gates. One of these, the one on the outside of the cell, is called the activation gate on your figure. And the one on the inside is called the inactivation gate of the sodium channel. <clears throat> Either one of those gates being closed will close the channel. <clears throat> you guys have all stayed in a motel where there's adjoining rooms and there's two doors. Either door being closed keeps you from going through, right? So same idea here. Either gate closed will close the channel. Under resting conditions, the activation gate is closed and the inactivation gate is open. This is just for the sodium channels. That means that sodium can't get through. It's blocked by the activation gate. We also have a potassium channel. What I said is missing from this figure is what I'm going to tell you right now. There's another potassium channel, what's often called the leak channel, that's always open. And that's missing from this figure. The potassium leak channel. Why is that important? Because I already told you that what? Under resting conditions. What's the permeability of the membrane under resting conditions? To potassium, right? So there's got to be a potassium channel open somewhere. And it's this other leak channel that's not shown to you in this particular figure that accounts for the high permeability to potassium under resting conditions. This potassium channel is a voltage operated channel, voltage regulated. And notice it only has one gate, and that gate is closed right now when we're at resting membrane conditions. Right, the one down here refers to the one up in the figure. We're at minus 70 millivolts resting conditions. Everybody good right now? Okay, now we stimulate and we go up here to number two. Number two is the depolarization phase, notice here. So this is inset <clears throat> graph two. And notice what happened, the activation gate closed. This activation gate is voltage operated. I mean, I'm sorry, it opened. Okay, so now we have an open activation gate. We have an open channel. We have an open channel, sodium will move in for the reasons that we talked about, concentration, and initially charge. And if we left that channel open, sodium would like to get the membrane potential all the way up to positive 61. But it turns out, so now 3 over here, 3 is the repolarization phase of the action potential, 3 is this graph up here, and two things happen, or this little cartoon figure, okay? The inactivation gate on the sodium channel swings closed. Inactivation gate swings closed, and at the same time, the gate on the potassium channel opens. Both of these gates, that sodium inactivation gate and the potassium gate, are also voltage regulated, but they're a little bit slower. And we might as well just talk about that right now. Notice this dotted line at minus 55. And notice the term threshold that points to this dotted line at minus 55. Minus 55 is the voltage that turns these guys on, all these different gates we're talking about. So minus 55 is often called threshold. If the membrane gets up to minus 55 millivolts, we're going to open sodium channels. So that's the reason why you see a minus 55 and a dotted line on your figure. Okay, that's threshold, Gary. Is that only for sodium? No, it also operates the other two gates, but those gates are slower. So we have a really fast gate, the activation gate, and two slower gates, the inactivation gate on the sodium channel and the potassium gate.
So if we close sodium channels, so up here at number three, if we close sodium channels, but we open potassium channels, what's going to happen to ion movement now? Potassium will move out. How come? Because potassium concentrations are much higher inside the cell than out. And also, notice what territory we're in right now. Are we above zero at this point? So that means the inside is positive relative to the outside. So at least initially here, there's also a charge attraction for potassium to move out. Does that make sense to everybody? Remember the charge by convention refers to the inside of the cell. So when we're above zero, the inside is positive relative to the outside. The outside is negative. So right here, there's both a concentration and a charge attraction for potassium to move out until we get below zero again. With positive charges moving out, potassium moving out, what happens to membrane potential? The inside becomes more negative, and that's why you see the repolarization phase. We see this line head back down again. And where would potassium like to have the membrane potential? Negative 90, okay? And so actually you notice that there's actually a small hyperpolarization or an undershoot. It actually goes a little bit past before the, the uh, what happens um, here at number four, we still have potassium gates open. Notice the sodium activation gate has reset. And now when we get all the way down to here, the potassium gates also finally close. We shift from four back to one. Okay? And the sodium-potassium pump goes to work, moving sodium and potassium back to the sides of the membrane where they belong, pumping potassium back in and sodium back out. And we're at resting conditions again and everything's back the way it was a few milliseconds ago. A lot of activity for three milliseconds? Yes. Okay. Do you understand the forces and why things are doing what they're doing? Why certain gates are opening and why when they open certain ions move in the direction they move, Justin? So, concentration. So you said concentration, I think, right? It's moving also because of charge, only as long as we're above zero. Once we're below zero, that means the inside is uh, more negative again, and then concentration is the only thing driving it anymore at that point. I'm sorry, what, Zena? That's, that's for potassium. Sodium moves because of charge and because of concentration, but only because of charge until we get above zero. Well, sodium, do you understand why? Or are you just writing down the details to memorize? So if we open, if we're down in this territory right here, we open a sodium channel. Which way will sodium move based on charge alone? If we just forget about concentration. Inside. inside why? Because the inside is more negative and sodium is positive, so the inside will attract the positive charge. But what about up here? Which way would sodium move based only on charge there? would actually move out based on charge there, right? Because now the inside is more positive. We just went above zero on the inside. Now the inside is more positive. So Concentration, though, still makes it move. Concentration still drives sodium movement inside. Go ahead, Zena. So you said that sodium is not inside because it's more negative on the inside, so it's like potassium on the inside? Yep. So but, is, but is there enough potassium on the inside to balance out the fixed anions? Right, not enough, right? There's a lot of potassium in there, but not enough to make it positively charged on the inside still. 
time. At the resting state, are there just <coughs> not channels, but just normal pumps that are going back and forth? The sodium and potassium. Are they, there's yeah, remember the sodium potassium pump that we talked about? Yeah. The other time, that is working even under resting conditions. And that's different than these channels. Correct. These are, do you see any ATP in this figure anywhere? Okay? Everything we've described here is passive movement. Until we're trying to restore at the very end, it's not shown in this figure, but I said the sodium and potassium pumps go to work to restore things. That's the only active part of this. Okay? Everything else is a channel opens and things just move based on charge and concentration Okay, down their gradients. It's all passive. Justin? Nope. No, it's a voltage. That it, when you get to that voltage, it doesn't require ATP to open to move those gates. Okay? They move based on voltage, and I'm sure there's some pretty incredible biophysics there that I don't know. Um, if you really like physics and you really like biology, a lot of biophysicists study the way channels and pumps work. There's lots of other biophysics areas too, but anyways. So the pump needs ATP to work for those gates to open? Yeah. By definition, if I say the word pump, what does that mean? It means active, and it means ATP is required. Okay? So these channels are not pumps, but the sodium-potassium pump is moving things against their gradients and requires ATP. Connor? Um, the potassium leak channel, that we, that's not up there? Yes. Can you say again what that's doing? Yeah, all it's doing is allowing... Remember that we said under resting conditions back on Tuesday? that the membrane is permeable primarily only to one positive charge. And what was that charge? Potassium. And the reason is because of these leak channels, because they're open under resting conditions. Potassium won't move just straight through the lipid bilayer. It needs a channel, and it's that leak channel that allows it to do that, okay? Hans? So is that due to size of the channel? Or that it's selective? Yes. There's some other properties, like you would think, what makes a channel selective for potassium versus sodium? And I don't know exactly for sure, okay? There's some other properties of the channels that make them selective um, that, again, a biophysicist might be able to tell me. But to be honest with you, I've never heard that anywhere in, in my physiology training or back or reading or anything. So good question. I understand that it does. Yeah, good question. So, I, so lots of channels are very selective, but I don't know exactly what it is about the channel conformation or charge alignments or whatever that makes... A channel selective for one ion that has a valence of plus one versus another one that has a plus one. Okay. So since the leak channel is only permeable to potassium, it's only a one-way channel there. Well, it would be a two-way channel if you change the conditions in the cell. But with the conditions the way they are, which way is potassium going to move if you open a channel? It's going to move out. Okay. If we did an experiment where we messed around with all the concentrations, you could have conditions where it would move the other way, too. So in resting, um, when the cell is resting, potassium is just moving out of the... And the sodium-potassium pumps are restoring it back. They're helping maintain that. Okay? So the pumps will supply the... Yeah, well, well the, initial, the initial phase, both of these are important. Probably the more important, actually, is not the sodium-potassium pump. It's the fact that we have those fixed anions combined with a membrane permeability mostly only to potassium. So potassium moves in, but sodium can't move in. Okay? Now we also have the sodium-potassium pumps helping do the same thing. Okay? And... If you're, let me go back a couple of slides, actually. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Notice the numbers here. I didn't talk about this last time. <clears throat> How many sodiums and potassiums are being moved for each ATP by this pump? Two potassiums are getting moved in, and three sodiums are getting moved out. What's that doing to charge across the membrane? 
It's actually moving more positives out than in, so the inside is becoming a little more negative because of this pump as well. Right? So we sometimes call this pump, I didn't use this word the other day, but electrogenic. Does that word make sense? What's the genic part of that word mean? What's the first book of the Bible? Genesis. What does the word Genesis mean? You generate something, okay? So, and what's it generating? Electro and electrical difference or a charge difference. So we sometimes call this pump electrogenic because it's helping maintain and maybe even create a little bit the charge difference across the membrane too. Isn't it nice that I can use the Bible to help describe a word? I don't think I could do that at UCLA. <laughs> Potassium is that just because of concentration? So it's negative inside, Because where would potassium like to have the membrane be? Negative 90. So as long as we're not all the way down to negative 90, Potassium will move out to try and make the inside more negative. What if I gave you a quiz question where the membrane started at minus 100 and I asked you which way potassium would move? Then it would move in, right? Because potassium wants that membrane at minus 90. Okay? So again, it depends on what conditions are present there. turns out, so I'll answer your question, but you don't have to remember this. There's not another sodium leak channel, but what happens is, let me go back to, to this picture. This gate right here does what, what, you'll understand this word too, but what the scientists call it flickers a little bit. In other words, it's not 100% closed all the time. It's doing a little bit of this. Okay? So that allows a tiny little bit of sodium to move through. And that's where we get that. Why we end up with a resting membrane potential of what? Minus, minus 70 millivolts. Okay? It allows sodium to play a little bit of role in determining what resting potential is. I'm glad you're asking all the questions. This is the time to get them cleared up. Everybody, are we headed in the right direction? So the flickering lets sodium in a little. The flickering lets sodium in a little bit, yep. Okay. I don't have a figure for this, but next term for an action potential, the next thing I want to talk about is that action potentials are what we call all or none. You can call it the all or none property of action potentials. What that means is that if we get up to minus 55 and the sodium gate's open, we're going to have a full action potential. If we don't get up to threshold, we're not going to have an action potential at all. So you either don't get one, or you get the whole thing. Under normal physiological conditions, the height or the magnitude of the action potential is not going to change. You can stimulate that cell ten times as hard. You're still going to get the same height of the action potential. Now, you don't have to write this down, but let me just tell you, experimentally, if I've got a neuron out of an animal, by the way, I should tell you, we'll do it in a lab next week, but the guys who discovered this are two guys named Hodgkin and Huxley, two British scientists. They got knighted for it. They won the Nobel Prize for it 50 years ago, some, some, somewhere in that neighborhood. And they took squid, and squid have a giant central axon that you can actually even see. 
okay? It's like three millimeters in diameter or something like that. And they took a kitchen roller like you'd roll out pastry with, and they laid this axon out on a table, and they rolled out all the cytoplasm out of it. And they took a syringe, and they could squirt in them whatever kinds of solutions they wanted to. And they started playing with different ions and all kinds of different things, and they would measure whether they got potentials. They had electrodes in there, and that's how they figured all this stuff out. Okay? So, you know, we've talked about scientific method and so on. This stuff isn't just all magic and it appears in your book somehow. People did a lot of hard work to discover these things. So, pretty cool stuff. Any of you read uh, 1984 in high school? Who's the author? Who is it? Oh, yeah, it is Orwell. Who's, um, what's the other futuristic one? Aldous Huxley. Which one does he do? do you know? Yeah, okay. Anyways, that's uh, like a cousin relation or something, too, with a scientific Huxley. So, a high-achieving family. Okay, so the all or none property says that action potentials are all going to be the same height under physiological conditions. Under normal conditions in your body, they're all going to be the same height. Can't change it. Either get the whole thing or you get none of it. So those of you who had lab on Tuesday, we've already addressed this a little bit. How can you change stimulus intensity then? For example, I have action potentials that go back up an afferent nerve, a sensory nerve, if I touch a hot stove. If I touch a warm stove versus a burning hot stove, doesn't my body want to know the difference? Because I better move my hand a lot faster under one of those conditions than the other. What tells my brain about how hot that is if the action potentials are all the same height? Patient? The number of times it's activated or the number of sensors that are activated. Got it. So Tuesday lab people are stepping up. So frequency of the action potentials, okay? How often... Even though you can't change the height of the action potential, you can send them much more frequently. So one way that we tell or that your body or that nerves code for stimulus intensity is by frequency. And the other one that Pesha mentioned is what we call recruitment. By recruiting or by activating more neurons. A nerve is a bundle of nerve fibers or neurons, and so we activate more of those neurons with a more intense stimulus. So how do we, how does the body help you know about stimulus intensity? By increasing frequency of the action potentials and by recruiting more neurons to be activated. So frequency and recruitment. Okay, so we've just been talking about action potentials and their all or none nature. There's another kind of potential, and we've talked about resting potentials, but I need to tell you about another kind of potential. And that potential <clears throat> is a graded potential. Graded as in not like grading cheese, but as in your tests are graded. Okay, G-R-A-D-E-D. -E -D. Graded potentials. Your next figure, which actually when I was looking at it this morning, I decided I'm not sure it's all that helpful, but it's supposed to tell you a little bit about graded potentials and, and the one after it too. Graded potentials are potentials that move one direction or the other from resting, but they don't reach threshold. Or if they do reach threshold, you get an action potential out of it. Okay. So the potentials, the movements of membrane potential from resting anywhere below threshold are graded potentials. Nothing happens as far as a signal in the neuron, okay? But let me back up a little bit. We're going to talk about this in the next unit, actually, okay, so we'll get there. But I can give, even if I have an electrode, I could stimulate the neuron just a tiny little bit, and I'll get some movement away from resting. 
But if I don't get all the way up to threshold, I won't get an action potential and that nerve won't send a signal. It'll just have a little response at that one local site, but it won't move anything, won't signal. Okay. So graded potentials happen at one local site. Action potentials don't die out as they move along the membrane. They keep moving along a membrane at the same height. But a graded potential does die out as it moves along the membrane, and that's what the next figure shows you. Okay, The distance, so if we stimulated right here, but we did not get up to threshold, a graded potential would die out again as it moves along the membrane in either direction. Graded potentials can be added to each other or subtracted. Action potentials can't. An action potential is always the same height, so it's not going to be added. It's going to be the same height. JJ? Added, like added height. So, yes, so if I stimulated this guy again, right here, let's say, then I could add it, and now we'd be up here somewhere. Okay, so they're additive in that way. So, and let me <clears throat> let me save these terms. Um, actually, let me just tell you that they can be excitatory if they're if they're moved more positive. The direction that this one here is shown to you, they can be excitatory. That's closer to threshold, so that's excitatory. They can also be inhibitory. In other words, they can make the cell membrane more negative. They can move more negative than minus 70. So graded potentials can be either excitatory, in other words, more positive, or inhibitory, in other words, more negative. Justin? Action potentials, yes, only excitatory. So your next figure looks like this, and this is just to emphasize what I've just been talking about. So here we have one, two, three, four different conditions that I'll describe to you in a minute in this figure. Notice that on the y-axis we have membrane potential, on the x-axis we have time. See these little black lines? When the arrow points up, it means we turned on stimulus. We turned on an electrical stimulator, for example. And when the arrow points down, we turned it off again. The length of the arrows, and by the way, this information is all in the legend. The length of the arrows tells you how strong the stimulus was. So the longer the length of this arrow, the stronger stimulus we applied. So let's just look at this first panel. We turn on a stimulator at a very low voltage, and we get a graded potential. It doesn't get all the way up to threshold. So as long as we leave this on, we have this graded potential, but it didn't get to threshold, so we never got an action potential. In the second panel, the arrow is longer. That means we increased the strength of the stimulus, more voltage in our stimulator. Now we move the membrane up above threshold and we got action potentials. I wish this figure did one thing different and that is these action potentials would come back down again, really, but the recording this figure is supposed to be showing you, the recorder just isn't fast enough to point to the fact that it does come all the way back down. Okay, This is happening in milliseconds and the recorder takes a few more milliseconds to respond. Notice that we keep it on, so we keep repeating action potentials. Notice they're all the same height. Let's move to the third panel. The arrow's longer, that means a stronger stimulus yet. We get above threshold, we get action potentials. Are the action potentials any higher or lower? No. Remember, an action potential is all or none, so same height, but with a stronger stimulus, what happens? They're more frequent. Okay, stronger stimulus, more frequent. Same height, but more frequent. And then the fourth panel shows you the same thing, just more magnified. Stronger stimulus, same height, 
but more frequent. Again, action potentials are all or none, and you can hit it with as strong a stimulus as you want. You're not going to change the height of that action potential, but you can change the frequency. Tanya? Height is voltage. So when you do this, remember that the sodium activation gates are opening, and that's allowing sodium to move in. But remember that the inactivation gates and the potassium gates are just a little bit slower, but they're going to do their thing one or two milliseconds later. So as soon as they do their thing, that stops sodium from coming in and making this more positive. Sodium is blocked, but potassium now starts to leave and it becomes more negative again. So you're not going to get a higher voltage than this. We said minus 30 on the last figure. This, the book that this comes out of has this a little bit lower, but you could think of this as minus 30 just for simplicity again. Okay, did that, did that help? Becca? It doesn't. Let me try and repeat what I was saying earlier, okay? The only reason this... Here's what I don't like about this figure. Every one of these is actually coming back down to resting. It's just that the recorder that they're modeling when they drew this figure isn't fast enough to show that it comes all the way back down, okay? Maybe I should make my own figure. be easier sometimes. You wouldn't believe how much time I spend looking in books and around the internet and so on to find figures that I think are describing what we want to talk about. So. Anybody else right here? You guys are warming up to asking questions. That's good. Next concept. Action potentials have a refractory period. The word refractory means that if you stimulate it, well, we're going to have two refractory periods. In a general sense, it means that if you stimulate the membrane, it's not going to respond. It's refractory. Refractory means it won't respond. Now notice if you look at the top of this figure, we have an absolute refractory period and a relative refractory period. Absolute means what it sounds like. Absolutely, no way, no how, if you stimulate this membrane during this time, it will not respond. It absolutely will not respond. So the absolute refractory period is a brief period of time. Notice that on this figure, it's the white, sh white area there. It's only about one and a half milliseconds. But if you stimulate again during that time, absolutely no way that membrane will respond with another action potential. It's refractory to stimulation. Hans? It's just because it's already stimulated. We'll talk about it. That's, in loose terms, that's why. We'll talk more specific in just a minute about why, okay? Notice that there's also another millisecond plus a little bit where the membrane is relatively refractory. And that means that it's not likely to respond, but if you hit it hard enough, if you give it a strong enough stimulus, it's possible to respond, okay? It usually won't respond to another stimulus, but if you whack it really hard, I don't mean with a hammer, I mean like with a high voltage, a super high stimulation, it can respond. Okay, so it's relatively refractory. Megan? So the action potentials, do they, are they always last the same amount of time? No matter how strong the signal is? Yeah. Yes, no matter how strong the signal is, yes. Okay. Now, if you want to talk about different species, not necessarily always, but in your body, an action potential is pretty similar all the time. Okay. Let's answer Hans's question in a second, or at least start to, okay, why do we have an absolute refractory period? Notice that it follows pretty closely to the time when we're having the action potential. 
Okay. Two reasons. Number one, during the first part, during the depolarization phase, sodium gates are already open. So if you stimulate, what's going to happen? All the sodium gates are open already. You can't open any more gates. So you're not going to get any additional response than you're already getting. Okay, so that's reason number one. That's basically the first half of the absolute refractory period. By the way, you can abbreviate ARP for absolute refractory period. Second reason, okay, during the depolarization part, during the second half of the absolute refractory period, what are the gating conditions? Anybody remember? What's the potassium gate? Open. And the sodium inactivation gate is closed. Okay? That sodium inactivation gate cannot open again. It cannot be reset to open again until you get down below resting. In other words, the resetting of that gate is voltage operated as well. So during this part, from roughly here to here, the inactivation gates are closed, and it doesn't matter if you stimulate that sodium channel or no matter how much, you can't open the inactivation gate until the membrane potential gets down back to resting, and that gate resets itself. I'm about a minute over, so again, you've got information to look at. If there's any questions, you can ask me right now, but otherwise, look at this stuff. We'll pick up here again on Monday. Are you starting to get, we started out with some simple stuff, but if I had to pick 10 areas during a semester that confuse students the most, action potentials are definitely one of them, okay? Action potentials require that you're thinking and understanding, not just memorizing. So go to your notes and bring me any questions that you need to. So, are you something about uh, this? All right, Daniel. See you later, bro. Have a good weekend, man.